Therese Ann Chivarella was born November 25, 1964, to Carmen and Mary. When she was nine years old, she lived at 533 Alter Street in Hazleton, Pennsylvania, and attended St. Joseph's School, which is now called Holy Family Academy, on North Laurel Street. On the very cold morning of March 18, 1964, about 8 a.m., she left home to walk the two blocks to school. She usually walked with her brother and sisters, but she left earlier that morning alone to drop off some canned goods for donation. She was last seen alive walking east on North Sidewalk near 212 West 4th Street at 8.10 a.m. She was one block west of Church Street, an area that was likely very busy with traffic. Sadly, around 1 p.m. later that day, her body was found nearly three miles away in a coal pit at an abandoned strip mine where locals often dump trash. The canned goods she was carrying to donate at the school were found near her body and her shoes were found farther away along with her pocketbook and school bag. The investigation revealed Maurice was physically and sexually assaulted and murdered. Police interviewed a number of suspects and compiled theories. One suspect, whose common-law wife lived on 4th Street in a home that Maurice passed by as she walked to the school, was scheduled to take a polygraph test, but instead of taking the test, he committed suicide. In 2007, numerous specimens collected from the victim's body and clothing were submitted to the Pennsylvania State Police Laboratory, and a suspect DNA profile was developed. However, it never matched any profiles in CODIS. In 2019, bodily fluids recovered from her body were sent to Parabon Nano Labs, and using new technology, they were able to create an image of what the killer could look like, including the color of their skin, eyes, and hair. DNA analysis showed Maurice's killer to have tan and fair skin, green or hazel eyes, and medium brown hair. The analysis even described the killer as being European, specifically from Italy, Greece, or of Middle Eastern descent. With the newly acquired DNA analysis, investigators could eliminate any suspects with blue, brown, or black eyes and anyone who is Asian or Native American. Sadly, the one thing the analysis did not suggest was the age of the killer. Therefore, three age-enhanced pictures of the man were created at ages 25, 40, and 60. Since the release of the images, investigators have received many tips as far away as California, but none have led to a suspect. Many people believe that her killer was the same person that raped and killed another nine-year-old girl named Carol Ann Doherty a year and a half earlier in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Her father found her body on the landing of the choir loft in St. Mark's Roman Catholic Church in Bristol on October 22, 1962. An article of clothing was stuffed in her mouth just like Maurice. The night before Maurice's murder, about a thousand people from Bristol were in Hazleton watching a high school basketball playoff game in the St. Joseph School Gym. Some believe Maurice's killer may have been in town that night from Bristol and stayed overnight. It's been 57 years since Maurice was murdered, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Keyshawn Bryant Vanderhorst was born July 17, 1993. He lived in the 1400 block of North 17th Street in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with his mother, Tina Vanderhorst. Tina had a long-standing drug and alcohol problem, and prior to Keyshawn being born, four out of her six children died as infants. Eight-month-old Terrence Slaughter died in 1980, three-month-old Katrina Stevens died in 1983, and 10-month-old Kenneth Stevens died in 1985. Their cause of death was considered to be pneumonia and sudden infant death syndrome, and Tina was never charged with any crime in the cases. Then, in 1988, she had a daughter, Marie, born premature and addicted to crack cocaine. She weighed only one pound at birth, and she never left the hospital before she died at four weeks old. Tina's remaining two sons, born in 1986 and 1987, had never lived with her, but instead were living with their paternal grandmother, and Tina often visited them. When Kishan was born in 1993, Tina was in jail, and he was taken from her immediately and placed into foster care, but was returned to her in 1994 when she was released from prison. 
Beginning in January 1995, a social worker began visiting her apartment regularly to provide counseling to Tina and help her care for Kashan. DHS workers who observed Tina during this time described her as a devoted mother and found no evidence of drug abuse. After six months, the social workers requested that DHS close their file on Kashan as they didn't believe he and Tina needed supervision. In August 1995, the file was closed and he would go missing the next month. Tina told her relatives and police that DHS had taken him, but her family became suspicious and her sister reported Kishan as a missing person three weeks later on October 13th. When investigators searched the apartment, it was described as filthy, cluttered, and rat infested. Tina repeated the story about Kishan being in DHS custody, but DHS had no child by that name in their care. She was then arrested for a parole violation and later charged with dealing in infants, which means the selling, trading, or buying of children. She was also charged with endangering the welfare of a child and corrupting the morals of a minor. After her story about Kishan and the DHS was proved to be false, Tina stated that she sold him to an African-American woman named Virginia Graham. She said that she did not know the woman that came to her apartment one day and offered to take Kishan because someone told her Tina was having difficulty caring for him. She said she was paid $500 in $20 bills and then used the money to buy crack cocaine. The woman told Tina she lived in Philadelphia and was married with two children of her own. If this woman actually exists, she has never been identified. Tina later changed her story yet again and stated that while under the influence of drugs, she took Keyshawn to a friend's fruit stand on Cecil B. Moore Avenue but couldn't remember what happened to him after that. Tina had often left him at the fruit stand for short periods of time prior to his disappearance, but would always come back and get him eventually. She pleaded no contest to child endangerment in connection with his case in November 1996 and was sentenced to two and a half to seven years in prison. At her sentencing hearing, she denied having sold him and repeated her story about giving him to a strange woman who came to her door. She said she was under the influence of drugs and alcohol and thought the woman was a DHS worker. Because police don't know what happened to Kishan, the charges against Tina were limited to endangering the child rather than harming him. Police began re-investigating Tina's other children's deaths after Kishan disappeared, but no charges were filed. Tina was arrested for prostitution at least once after her release from prison. She was later arrested in 2016 for stabbing a Germantown, Pennsylvania man to death and burning his body, but was acquitted in 2017. Only two of Tina's seven children are known to be alive, and that is the two boys born in 1986 and 1987 that were never in her care and were taken care of by their paternal grandmother. Keyshawn has never been located, and if he's still alive today, he would be 28 years old. Anthony Peter Timolo was born February 28, 1952, and lived on Princeton Avenue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On October 15, 1966, Anthony and his best friend, Jack Marino, both 14 years old at the time, got up early to do their usual paper routes, delivering the Philadelphia Inquirer. After completing their routes, the two met at a bakery on Torresdale Avenue and bought a dozen donuts to share. They spent the day riding their bikes until the two separated to go home for dinner. As usual, they planned to meet up after dinner to ride their bikes in the neighborhood. A couple of hours later, Anthony finished his dinner and told his parents that he was going to ride his bike over to Jack's house. The two usually passed one another, but this day they somehow missed each other, and when Jack arrived at Anthony's house, he learned that Anthony had just left to meet him at his house, so he went back home. Once he arrived, his parents said Anthony had not been there, so Jack spent the next several hours riding around the city until the sun started to go down, but he couldn't find him. Sadly, Anthony never came home that night, but his parents weren't concerned because they thought he'd decided to spend the night at Jack's house. They didn't realize anything was wrong until the next morning when several customers on Anthony's paper route called to ask why their newspapers hadn't been delivered. 
This immediately concerned his parents because Anthony was always very prompt with his deliveries. Anthony and his parents had gotten into an argument the day before he went missing, and police thought he might have run away. Anthony hadn't been doing very well in school, and his parents thought that his paper route was to blame. They wanted him to quit, but he didn't want to. Five days after he disappeared, two of his 8th grade classmates at Our Lady of Consolation arrived late for school and told one of the nuns that they had seen Anthony while they were walking to school. They had attempted to chase after him, but he outran them and they had been so consumed with trying to catch up with their missing classmate that they hadn't realized they were late for school. The nun accepted their excuse and sent them off to class without punishment and police were notified that Anthony had been sighted in the area. The police stopped looking for him after that, believing he was safe and did not want to be found. They told his parents that he was probably still angry about their fight and would come home when he was ready. At this point, Anthony's parents had accepted that their son was a runaway and they believed that he would eventually return home. They were so confident in this belief that they didn't even bother to call relatives and tell them he was missing. However, his friend Jack disagreed and became very frustrated with the adults over the runaway theory. Because of this theory, it would take months before the adults realized that foul play may be involved. However, Anthony's mother refused to believe that he might be dead. She clung to the hope that he had been in an accident, causing him to lose his memory, envisioned him wandering around the city, unable to remember his name or address. His father also thought that Anthony had been in an accident, but doubted that he had survived and didn't like to talk about it. Jack somehow knew that Anthony wasn't a runaway because of how close they were, and he had never confided in him about wanting to do that. Anthony was also very close to his family, including his eight siblings. He also left behind an uncashed paycheck, some cash, and other belongings in his room, another sign that he had not planned to run away. Jack later became a Philadelphia police officer, and many years after Anthony disappeared, he ran into an old classmate, one of the boys who had reported seeing Anthony shortly after he disappeared. He admitted that he and his friend had lied about seeing Anthony because they were late for school because they had been smoking and didn't want to get into trouble. Jack believes Anthony was possibly struck by a vehicle while riding his bicycle and the driver panicked and hid his body and the bike, which has never been found. Interstate 95 was under construction in the area around the time he disappeared, and it would have been relatively easy to conceal a body his size at the construction site. Anthony was only 5 foot 1, weighing about 110 pounds. As of today, Anthony has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Amy Leanne Pugner was born September 21, 1969 and graduated from La Trobe Area High School in Pennsylvania. She became a teen mom and suffered from paranoid schizophrenia and substance abuse. She also has three sisters, Kelly, Jonah, and Beth. In 2009, her sister got her set up in rehab for treatment, but after going, she only stayed for five days. She then moved from La Trobe, Pennsylvania to Washington, Pennsylvania into an apartment in the 700 block of North Main Street. Her family still cared a lot for her and would often bring her back to La Trobe to see her children. When her sister spoke to her on June 8, 2010, Amy said she was in the middle of painting her new apartment. The next day, Amy's sister and father, John Pugner, would get some strange text messages and phone calls from Amy's phone. One of the calls John would receive would say something along the lines of Amy's dad or Amy's dead. Eventually, the phone would die and the male person who had been communicating with them would switch to an unknown number. He said that Amy had stolen something from him and he wanted $30,000 or he would kill her. The last call that her father received was from Amy herself. She said not to worry and that she would be okay. Amy's sister asked to speak to her to prove she was alive and only heard a mumbling that sounded like someone's mouth had been covered or taped shut. The man told her father and sister to drop the $30,000 off at the McDonald's in Mount Oliver, Pennsylvania. The text with the instructions said they have no intentions of harming her and update on Amy herself and what time to drop the money. However, her family couldn't deliver the money and the man stopped all communication. 
Sadly, they have never heard from Amy again. On June 10th, her family came to Washington and reported her missing. Authorities could find no evidence of a struggle in her apartment. Her family does not rule out the possibility that the disappearance was a ploy to get drug money, a scheme in which Amy may have participated in. But she missed her son's high school graduation after her disappearance, which is uncharacteristic of her. As of today, Amy has not been found and this case remains unsolved. Juanita Marie Todd was born December 16, 1949, to Mimi and Junius Todd. At the age of 22, she was a mother of two young girls and lived in a second-floor apartment at 13 Academy Street in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. On September 28, 1972, at 3.10 a.m., an unidentified man called the police department and said that there had been a homicide at an Academy Street apartment in the city and gave the address and hung up the phone. Several police officers were immediately dispatched to the address, and when they gained access to the apartment, they found Juanita's body. She had been stabbed and strangled to death. There were no signs of a sexual assault, and both of her girls were unharmed. Police found 18-month-old Odetta sitting on the floor next to her mother's head. Her sister, 5-month-old Tamu, was in her crib in another room. Both children were taken to the hospital to be checked out. The coroner determined that Juanita had been dead for about 15 hours by the time her body was discovered. Her bedroom was tidy, and it didn't appear that any sort of large struggle had taken place before she was killed, although there was a lot of blood splattered throughout the room. A couple living on the first floor reported hearing no noises coming from the second floor at the time when the murder may have occurred. They did, however, mention a man who they assumed was living in the apartment with Juanita. Detectives would later tell the media that they were looking into the possibility of a common-law husband but were not able to confirm it. Once Juanita's identity had been confirmed, detectives were sent to the home of her parents, Mimi and Junius. Her parents were devastated when they learned that she had been murdered. They quickly took their granddaughters into their care and would raise both girls to adulthood. They were too young to have any memory of their mother and grew up referring to Mimi and Junius as their mother and father. The story made the front page of the Times Later Evening News the same day her body was discovered. It soon became apparent that there would be no quick arrest. Whenever detectives attempted to speak with individuals they believed had knowledge of the crime, they were met by a stony wall of silence. The case would soon go cold because individuals in the area and in her life, except for her family and some co-workers, refused to speak to detectives about the crime. Bit by bit, detectives tried to piece together the events leading up to Juanita's murder. The last time anyone who spoke with investigators had seen Juanita was on Tuesday evening. Her murder took place sometime around noon on Wednesday. Her neighbors hadn't heard anything unusual during that time period, but it was obvious that someone besides Juanita and her daughters had been in the apartment. Detectives determined that the children had not been alone with their mother's body for the entire 15 hours because they found evidence that at least one person had been in the apartment and had likely fed the children. When police first made entry into the apartment at 3.15 a.m., they had found an open loaf of bread sitting out on the kitchen counter. Despite being unwrapped, the bread was still soft and fresh, indicating that it hadn't been sitting there long. As bizarre as it seemed, it appeared that Juanita's killer had either remained in the apartment for hours after the murder or had returned at some point, perhaps to check on the children. This, coupled with the fact that there were no signs of forced entry, caused detectives to believe that Juanita had been killed by someone close to her. Unfortunately, those closest to her were still refusing to speak with detectives. Within two days, police traced the anonymous phone call to a payphone in the Penn Plaza Shopping Center on South Main Street, less than a mile away from the crime scene. By November 12, 1972, investigators said that 50 people had been interviewed and four men and one woman underwent a polygraph test. However, two men and a woman refused a request by detectives to take the test. Despite a lack of cooperation from several people that detectives believed were key witnesses, it didn't take long for investigators to zero in on at least one potential suspect. 
but detectives declined to comment about the identity of this person and admitted that they needed more evidence before any charges could be filed. They made several more public appeals for information, but were unable to get any additional information about the suspect because people refused to talk. Months went by with little movement on the case. The initial intensity that had surrounded the investigation had died down, and by the time a year had passed, only three detectives were still assigned to the case. Before the second anniversary of her death, it was clear that the case had gone cold. Although detectives had concrete physical evidence obtained from her apartment, they still needed more evidence before anyone could be charged with the murder. As of today, no suspects have been arrested and this case remains unsolved.